So I bought the new MacBook Air with the M1 chip, not to replace my current iMac, but to replace my iPad Pro, because I feel for what I'm using the iPad for, this can replace it by about 95%. But on top of this, it can also do a lot of the things that I'm missing on the iPad Pro when out in the field. A little bit of video editing, transcoding files, or basically everything that I would consider pro work. But then when I saw all the other reviews online and everybody was hyping this machine, I really wanted to know if maybe it can replace my iMac. So I really wanted to test it out in a real world scenario and do some editing with it. So by now there's a lot of reviews out there about video editing but I feel none of them actually used the machine to actually edit some video. Most of them just played back some files, exported and transcoded, but I really did miss a review where somebody used this in an actual real world environment and edited an entire project like they would on any other machine. And this is what I tried to do and the results may differ a little bit from what I've seen online, but more on that after the intro. So as I would with any other editing machine, I hooked it up to my 4K screen, my RAID system, as well as my mouse and my keyboard. So when it comes to my editing work, I use a lot of different flavors when it comes to codecs and cameras I shoot with. Mainly I shoot with the C300 Mark III and I shoot everything in Canon RAW, but I also shoot some XFAVC sometimes. I also use the R5 as well as the R6 and strictly use their H.265 codecs or transcode them into ProRes. So as you can see, I use a lot of different cameras, so I really wanted to test what a workflow would look like mixing all of these different footages like I do on a daily basis when editing these YouTube videos. So I fired up Final Cut Pro 10 and I already saw the first message that I really didn't want to see. It basically said that all of my plugins are now incompatible with my M1 chip. All of my plugins for Motion VFX as well as Color Finale and also Need Video. And these are plugins that I need on a daily basis when editing these YouTube videos. And I was really curious about how the M1 chip could actually handle all the tracked motion graphics and the noise reduction. But none of these are compatible as of right now, so I actually need to do this in a later video. So right off the gate, I can't use this as my main editing machine because it's just not compatible with all my plugins. But I could use it for some different stuff. So that's what I actually did. I still had an unedited client project which I mainly shot on the XFAVC codec on the C300 Mark III. And I didn't use any plugins for this and I probably wouldn't even when this project would be finished. So I decided to start this one up and started to edit. And when I started the playback, everything looked as I was promised in all these other YouTube videos and I was really surprised because the XFAVC on a C300 is no easy codec to edit with. But then after about 20-30 seconds when I started moving around some clips and moving my playhead on the timeline or doing some speed ramps, it did become stuttery, a little laggy and not as smooth as I was promised. So basically after about a minute or two of editing, every time I set my playhead to a different location and tried playing it back, it took about a second or two to actually start playing back smooth. And this really wasn't a big deal and you could still really easily edit on this machine, but it definitely wasn't as smooth as my current iMac. So yes, you can totally edit these files on the MacBook Air if you have to, but if I had to choose between the iMac and the MacBook, I would definitely choose the iMac. So I closed this project for later and I opened another one and I want to do a review about the DJI RS2 coming up next week. And here we shot most of the behind the scenes with the R5 and the R6. So I really wanted to use the R5 files as is and not transcode them into ProRes, which I usually have to do when editing on the iMac. And here all the promises that were made came true because I could edit the R5 files with no problems at all and that was 4K25, 4K50 as well as 4K100 and my computer had absolutely no problems. I could do some speed ramping or even play them back in reverse and just basically edit around an entire timeline without having any problems or any legs at all. 
And I also didn't stop there and I gave the MacBook to Belle because her main camera is the R6 and she really doesn't want to transcode into ProRes because the files are just too big for her. So she usually uses proxies on her 16 inch MacBook Pro, but with this she didn't have to. And what she does is a lot of speed ramping, going back and forth, playing back footage in reverse and also stacking up layer of layer. And she reported that she had absolutely no problems with two layers of R6 files. When she put a third layer on top, then the MacBook became laggy and really started to drop frames. But before that, when just using everything in one timeline or basically just stacking it up onto the second layer, the MacBook had absolutely no problems of editing the files. And this is really good to know, because for people that mainly shoot on the R5 or the R6, that is a huge improvement over the iMac or the MacBook Pro 16 inch, or basically any other Mac that doesn't have an M1 chip right now. And even though I couldn't use this as my mainly driver because of all the missing plugins, I still wanted to know how the MacBook Air handles my C300 RAW files. So I installed the plugin for Final Cut and I actually had no problems at all with it. And to my surprise, it actually started playing back those files smoothly, with color corrections, a LUT enabled and a little bit of minor modifications. And it had absolutely no problems and didn't drop any frames until about 20 to 30 seconds in. And I, that was basically the same result on the other test that I did before, that it does work in the beginning, but then it slowly starts dropping frames. And this is the lowest spec version of the MacBook Air. I have eight gigabytes of RAM. I didn't even get the eight core GPU. And as we all know, it doesn't have a fan. So maybe the results are different when using the MacBook Pro 13 inch with an additional fan and more gigabytes RAM. And that is the model that Bell has ordered, but it's not here until the next two weeks, but I will do a follow up review with the stronger machine. So make sure to subscribe. But overall, I was really surprised that it even started to play back these files and actually had no problems. And I did the same test on the C200 RAW files. And here I had the same results. It worked for about 20 to 30, sometimes even 40 seconds, but then it started to drop frames. But even those drop frames, they weren't even that bad. I could see on the indicator that it dropped frames, but I couldn't really see it in the footage. And the footage looked somewhat smooth. So you could totally edit those files in high resolution on the MacBook Air, which is completely insane. So I didn't really want to stop there and I also ran another test and that is transcoding the R5 files into ProRes. Ironically, I really wouldn't have to do this if this was my main machine because it plays them back fine natively, but there are scenarios where I would still use this. For example, this week we do have a shoot for a Canadian director and after this shoot we typically hand over all these files to the director. And I really don't want to give him the R5 files and we probably use the R5 as a second second angle camera. And I don't want to hand out files that the director can't handle. So I would have to transcode them into ProRes on set. And I would really want to know how fast is the MacBook Air when transcoding these files compared to my iMac. So here I ran a quick and dirty test and I took about 180 gigabytes of our five files. And that was a mixture of 25 frames, 50 frames and 100 frames. And I just transcoded all of them into ProRes using Final Cut and my iMac took one hour and 17 minutes. So this is 77 minutes in total to transcoding all these files. And then I ran the exact same task on the MacBook Air and it took a staggering 44 minutes. And that is just crazy because this is almost twice as fast as the iMac. And that is just incredible because this is an 828 euros machine. This is all I paid for it. I paid 828 euros plus taxes because I got a Black Friday deal. And that is a lot less than I paid for my iPad Pro, for example. And this machine transcodes faster than my iMac. And that's just insane. All right, so what's my verdict of using the MacBook Air for the first time and my first impression of it? Can it replace my iMac? Not yet. And this isn't only due to the fact that all my plugins are incompatible because I'm sure this will change in a matter of weeks the most, but it's still not as pleasant of an editing experience when compared to my iMac for most of the footage that I use. 
when shooting in Canon RAW as well as XFAVC also using more complex timelines with a lot of effects and motion graphics and all that kind of stuff then the experience isn't as great as on my iMac which handles all of these with ease but when it comes to the R5 and R6 H.265 files the computer has absolutely no problem of playing these back and if the R5 would be my only camera for shooting video, I would probably replace my iMac with the M1 MacBook Air because it just handles these files faster. I'm also really curious now where my limitations lie. Is this because I have the lowest spec MacBook Air with only 8GB of RAM and no fan and the MacBook Pro 13 inch with a fan and 16GB of RAM might actually be able to handle all my workflows better because most of the dropped frames I only encountered after working after like 30 seconds or a minute. So maybe this is due to thermal throttling or the RAM just clogging up after a while. So maybe with the MacBook 13 inch this is actually a much better experience even in Canon RAW or the XFAVC files but we have to find out in a later review when Belle gets her laptop. But overall even though we are not 100% there yet and that is absolutely to be expected because we're talking about an 800 euro MacBook Air and MacBook Air was absolutely nothing to even consider doing some video editing work for in the past and now I can actually edit some of these things faster than on my iMac or sometimes close to it. This is completely insane and I can't wait what Apple does with their Pro machines in the future and I'm really worried about the resale value of my iMac 5K and I urge pretty much everyone right now not to buy an Intel Mac and just wait what Apple has in store for these M1 Silicon Macs in the near future. Alright, so one last mention before I actually wrap this video up because I mentioned in the beginning that I want to replace my iPad Pro with the MacBook Air and in hindsight I actually came closer to replacing my iMac than my iPad Pro with it because I was promised some wrong things because the way I understood it in the presentation is that I can now use all my iPhone and iPad apps on my MacBook Air which just isn't true because it's more like the developer now has the option to translating their existing iPad or iPhone app into a version for the M1 MacBook Air. But none of the apps that I was looking for were already there yet. And the ones that were, were a really bad experience using them on a non touchscreen display. So overall, the experience just isn't as immersive as it is on an iPad Pro for most of the stuff like media consumption. When it comes to all the Pro work and the workflows, there's absolutely no comparison between the iPad and the MacBook Air and the MacBook Air kills the iPad in basically every regard. But when it comes to all the other stuff like media consumption and stuff you would actually use an iPad for, it's just not as good of a replacement as I hope it would be, but I will update you a little bit more on that on my Instagram channel, so make sure to follow me there as well. And if you want to see more stuff about filmmaking, reviews of the new DJI gimbal, and my follow-up review when Bell's laptop is here, make also sure to subscribe to this channel, enable notifications to be notified when all the new reviews come up, and give this video a thumbs up, because it helps the channel grow. And I hope to see you on the next one.